right. Cool. Awesome. Send it to you, Samantha. All right, we have everyone joined. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. We want to welcome everyone to our Historical Writers Forum Zoom talk today, which was a popular topic, it looks like, on the mysterious woman in the Bay of Tapestry. So I'm really excited to see everyone, and we have some great panelists here today that I'm looking forward to hear what, hearing what they say. Um, to introduce myself first, I'm Samantha Wilcoxon, one of the admins of the Historical Writers Forum, and I um, have written about the early Tudor era, and then more recently, actually jumping way ahead into the uh, 1900s and uh, about the Radium Girls, and then currently I'm writing about the American Revolution. So I guess I'm kind of a historical wanderer. And um, our panelists today are historian Sharon Bennett Connolly, who is also an admin of the Historical Writers Forum. And she is a member of the Royal Historical Society, has been a TV expert for Australian television's Who Do You Think You Are? And writes a popular history blog, The History, The Interesting Bits. She is a best-selling author of four nonfiction history books, including Silk and the Sword, The Women of the Norman Conquest, in which she has an entire chapter on the identity of our mysterious lady today, Elkiva. And she is going to be the champion for Aid Gifu, hopefully I'm saying that right, the abbess of Leominster. So she is, that's our first panelist. Our second one is going to be Patricia Bracewell. And her love of reading led to a master's degree in literature, a career as a high school English teacher, and a fascination with English history. Shadow on the Crown is the first novel in her trilogy about the 11th century Queen of England, Emma of Normandy. Really great book. Debuted in 2013, her second novel, The Price of Blood, in 2015, continues the story of the woman whose, woman whose marriage to the English king set in motion events that would culminate in the Norman conquest of 1066. In 2014, Patricia was honored to serve as writer in residence at Gladstone's Library in Wales, where she conducted research for the final book in her Emma of Normandy trilogy, the Steel Beneath the Silk, published in 2021. And so you can probably guess who she is championing, Emma of Normandy. And then we'll have Paula Lofting, who has always had a love of history since she was a little girl. Is her dream to one day write a historical saga set in the medieval period. This dream was eventually realized when she published her first novel, Sons of the Wolf series, and then second, Wolf Banner and is working on the third, Wolf Spain. She has also collaborated on a historical fiction ghost anthology, Hauntings, that's a historical writers forum anthology, and is participating in, uh, what's his name? Ian Dale's latest book on kings and queens. And her blog is 1066, The Road to Hastings and Other Stories. And she is going to be the champion for El Gifu of Northampton. Sorry, I'm not getting these names right. I'm trying. <laughs> and then we'll have Carol McGrath. She writes historical fi fiction published by Headline and historical nonfiction for Pen and Sword. She wrote and researched the Bayou Tapestry for the Handfasted Wife about Edith Swanneck, Handfasted Wife to Her King Harold II. The successful novel was followed by books about Edith and Harold's daughters. She focuses on women in history, hoping to bring their stories out of history's shadows. Carol lives in Oxford, Oxford, well, sorry. Oxfordshire. <laughs> and Grace. <laughs> and she is going to be the champion for Elf Giva, sister of King Harold. All right. So with all that, I think um, everyone has a great presentation planned. So we should probably just get right into those. We're going to let each panelist make their case for their lady and then issue some challenges to each other. So it should be a lot of fun. So Sharon Bennett Connolly, she's going to start us off. Go ahead, Sharon. Okay, bear with me. I just have to get the PowerPoint up. <laughs> and start from oh, the beginning again. All right, um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, seeing as I'm first up, I'm going to give you a little bit of um, 
a background with the Bayeux Tapestry and then I'll introduce my lady. So we'll start with a couple of facts on the Bayeux Tapestry. Firstly, it's not a tapestry, it's an embroidery. Um, in the UK, it's called the Bayeux Tapestry. In France, it's known as La, Tapis la Tapisserie de la Reine Mathilde. Um, hang on, just got to admit somebody. <laughs> It was commissioned in the 1070s, probably by Bishop Odo of Bayeux. It's 70 meters long, but there is, um, it is missing some end panels, um, which may have depicted William the Conqueror's coronation, but we don't know because they're not there. And although it is 70 meters, at least 70 meters long, it is just 50 meters wide. So it's basically a long strip of um, embroidery. It's told from the viewpoint of the victorious Normans, but in places it demonstrates a sympathetic view of the English, which makes people think that it was actually sewn, stitched by um, English nuns in Canterbury or something like that. There was definitely, it wasn't just Normans doing the stitching. It tells the story from 1064 and Harold's visit to Normandy and ends at the Battle of Hastings on the 14th of October, 1066. Out of 626 human figures, only three are women. The first is identifiable as Edith, Queen Edith of Wessex, the sister of Harold Godwinson and the wife of Edward the Confessor. And she's there at Edward the Confessor's deathbed, which is how we know it's her. The second woman is a woman and child fleeing from a house being set on fire by the invading Normans. Um, she's not identified in the in this scene, but it's been, it's thought that this could be Edith Swanneck, the first wife of King Harold, who was set aside so that he could marry the um, more influential Edith. And it's possibly Harold. So there's Edith, and it is possibly Harold's youngest son, Ulf, who she is pulling from the burning building. Now, the third woman is the one we're talking about this evening. And this is, excuse the, the pronunciation, apparently all of us pronounce it differently. We've, had a, we've been having a discussion for 10 minutes about how to pronounce her name. Um, but it's Elfgifu or Elfgifu. And um, she appears in the scenes where Harold is in Normandy. She's identified, the actual scene identifies her as um, here a certain cleric and Alf giver. And the cleric is either smacking her in the face or giving her a blessing, we don't know which. I do like the rocky at the side of him though. Um, the archway suggests that she's actually inside a building, possibly a church, but we don't know. Um, and the phrase is incomplete. Here a certain cleric and elf giver. We don't know who the cleric is, um, although suggesting he's a certain cleric suggests he's quite a famous one, but we don't know who he is. Um, and it doesn't say what the cleric and elf giver are doing. And so we don't have a lot of information about what is going on um, in the scene, except that it's between a cleric and elf giver. Um, and it doesn't identify which elf giver. The elf giver or elf gifu was quite a popular name in the 11th century. There are a good number of them. I went through, I actually wrote a chapter in Silk and the Sword, which sort of um, inspired this talk. Um, it was the last chapter in the book and it is called The Mysterious Woman in the Bayeux Tapestry. Because, and I went through and had a look and start to see which elf giver it could be. And there are so many elf givers in the 11th century. It's like, we really need her surname or something to identify her, because we don't know. And yet this is, she must have been important because she is one of only three women on the Bayer Tapestry. And she, she is the only woman who has a leading role in the tapestry. She's identified, she's center stage, um, and yet we don't know who she is. So we think she must have been famous in the 11th century. What this is referring to was an incident that everybody knew about because the only information that you needed at that time was that it was Elfgiver and a cleric, and you would have known instantly who they were talking about. 
Unfortunately, 950 years later, we don't. So um, tonight we are going to try and work out who this is. And so I'm going to introduce my candidate. Um, I have a little issue with it in that she, she's actually the only candidate who doesn't actually have the name Elfgiver. I think this is a lady named Edgifu, or Edgiver. Um, she was the abbess of Leominster in 1046, and her story um, is so significant that it made it into the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And her story relates to Swain Godwinson, the older brother of King Harold. In 1043, Swain had been given an earldom comprising of lands in Herefordshire, Gloucestershire, Berkshire, Oxfordshire, and Somerset. So he was basically West Country and on the Welsh borders. In 1046, he was campaigning in Wales, um, in Southern Wales, alongside Griffith, the King of Gwynedd. When the campaign ended successfully, Swain headed home, and he headed home via Leominster, um, where Idgifu was abbess. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, Swain ordered the abbess of Leominster to be fetched to him, and he had her as long as he liked, after which he let her go home. Not a lot of detail there, to be honest. Basically, he had Edgifu brought to him, spent time with her, sent her home. How much time he spent with her, we don't know. What happened in that time, we don't know, but we can guess. He basically abducted a nun. Um, there's a suggestion that he did try to marry her. So um, not only did he abduct her, he probably did other things with her. He did try to marry her, but the king refused permission. Edward the Confessor was the king at the time, well known for his piety, horrified at the idea of Swain marrying an abbess, who was, you know, a nun, and um, an abbess who'd been dedicated to her, her life to God and then been abducted. So, even the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop of Worcester um, weighed in and they threatened Swain with excommunication. Ed Gifu, as a result, was eventually released, um, possibly after as much as a year in Swain's custody. Swain was forced to leave England and went into exile, returning a few months later, although he then murdered his cousin Bjorn Estridsson and was exiled again. He was back in England when his father, um, and the rest of the Godwins, Godwinsons rose against the king in 1051. To avoid war and condemnation by the Witten, the Godwinson, Earl Godwin and his sons left England. Um, but not before Godwin was forced to give up his youngest son Wolfnoth as um, a hostage and Swain gave up his son Hakon. The Godwins returned in 1052, spring 1052, but without Swain. Swain had gone on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, a barefoot pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Long way to walk with no shoes on, I tell you, I wouldn't do it. Um, and he died on the return, during the return journey. So we look at these two hostages, Wolfnoth and Hakon. Wolfnoth, we know, was the son of Godwin and Githa the Earl and Countess of Wessex. Hakon was Swain's son. Now we don't, there's no record of Swain ever getting married. So Hakon was probably an illegitimate son. In fact, there's no record of Swain being with any woman except Edgifu. So we can surmise that Edgifu is actually the mother of Hakon. These two boys had been handed over as hostages in 1051 before Godwin left England. When Godwin returned in 1052, the children had already been spirited away to Normandy by Edward the Confessor's supporters and out of the grasp of the Godwins. They couldn't get those children back. If Hakon was Ed Gifu's son, by Swain, it is highly possible that Ed Gifu, um, now a disgraced nun, actually travelled with her son to Normandy. 
if Hakon had been born through this union, he was about five or six years old at this time. So it may have been suggested that his mother go with him in order to keep, to make, because he was so young, basically. And this would explain her inclusion in the tapestry. It would also explain the fact that the cleric involved is, who is touching her face? He may be giving her a blessing, he may be chastising her for having a child out of wedlock, or it may be a demonstration of a Gifu's links to the church. If the scene, now then we go on to the scene before Ed, Alf Gifu, Ed Gifu, and that is Harold talking, Harold here talking to Duke William. If he's here discussing the return of his brother and his nephew, the hostages, and pointing to the mother of one of the hostages, that would explain the whole scene. With his father dead, Hakon was no longer a valuable hostage and was allowed to return to England with Harold which suggests that Ed Gifu would have come back with him as well. Ed Gifu's disgrace as being a nun who had a child may also explain the lewd sexual references represented by the naked man in the margins of the tapestry, or naked men rather. If you look down here, we've got one who is very clearly a man and very clearly naked. And then there's another one here with an axe who doesn't appear to have many clothes on either. So, and then above we have a cross above where the cleric and Egifu are, which might suggest that this building that she's in is actually a church. Now I can hear you all shaking your heads and saying, no, it says Elfgifu, not Egifu. That's a really big stretch. Yes, it is a flaw in the argument. Except that the Bayer tapestry is not 100% accurate. It, there are mistakes in the tapestry elsewhere. Um, one of Harold's brothers, Leofwin, is identified as Lewin instead of Leofwin. So it's not the only name that's wrong. And that is the only flaw in my argument. Everything else makes sense. So that's my candidate. Um, Edgifu is Elfgifu. Over to you. Who's next? <laughs> Over to you, Samantha. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. I think you made a great case. So I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of them and hearing the different challenges. So if Pat has unmuted herself, we'll get uh, onto her defense of Emma of Normandy. Thank you. <clears throat> Sharon, could you show the image that is the really long one that shows all of the, that entire scene? I'm going to be, um, so a couple before this one, I think. That one. Okay, and as I talk about the various elements here, perhaps you could use your pointer to show what I'm talking about. Um, my candidate for Elgiva is Emma of Normandy. She was the mother of King Edward the Confessor, and she was the great aunt of William the Conqueror. Now, in 1002, Emma married Ethelred the Unready, and at her coronation, she was given the English name Elgiva the name of a saintly ancestress of the royal family. And it was a name that she embraced. We know this because in every royal document that she witnessed, she signed as Elfiba, the exact name that we see there on that tapestry in Latin, not as Emma. So for 50 years, the most prominent woman of the age who was named Elfiba was this twice crowned queen of England. But Emma died in 1052. So what is she doing on this tapestry that documents events that happened in 1065 and 1066, more than a decade after her death? To answer that question, we have to consider the images just to the left of Elfiba, as well as those in the border above and below, because they are all connected. 
In the image on the left, Earl Harold, the man with the mustache, has arrived at Duke William's palace in Rouen, and the two men are speaking together. This meeting between them is clearly significant or it wouldn't be here. So what are they talking about? Notice that Harold and Duke William and even the counselor standing behind the Duke are all pointing and they're pointing at Alfiva. So it's clear to me that she is the focus of the conversation. I believe that William is making a case here for his claim to the throne of England by pointing out his blood link to the current King, Edward the Confessor, through Edward's mother, Alfiva. That blood link was going to be a significant factor in choosing Edward's successor. It was so significant that Edward had sent men to Europe to find the son and grandson of his half brother, King Edmund Ironside, and convey them back to England. And the grandson was living at Edward's court at this time. And he had a blood claim to Edward's throne. And he was probably something that William was really worried about. Now, William knows the value of his own blood link to Edward through Edward's mother. He also knows that Harold, this guy standing in front of him, is the wealthiest, most powerful Earl in England. And that Harold's father had been Godwin, the kingmaker who had supported the claims of Alfiva's sons, Arthur Canute and Edward, when they made their bids for the English crown. Duke William knows that whoever makes a claim for the throne after Edward's death is going to need Harold's support. And William wants Harold in his corner. So that's what the conversation is about. But how do the embroiderers portray the gist of this conversation about a blood link between William and King Edward? I disagree with Sharon. I think they have given us numerous clues in the borders and um, that's something that they do occasionally in the tapestry. The things in the borders comment on what is happening in the central panel. So if we look to the border above William and Harold, we can see centered there a pair of peacocks, male and female peacocks. They were symbols of royalty. So here we have a royal pair suggesting that this is a discussion about a royal marriage, not a ducal marriage, but a royal marriage. I'm gonna come back to that border in a minute, but for, for right now, let's look at Elfiva and the priest in the central panel. What we are seeing here is the moment in 1001 when King Ethelred sent an emissary to Normandy to attain the hand of the daughter of the Norman Duke. We see her in her Norman tower. Note that the priest is approaching her from outside her tower. He has come from away. Also look at how he's dressed. His clothes are pretty extravagant for a priest, suggesting that he's from the court. He's a royal emissary and he is bearing the king's offer of marriage. Not only that, he is a stand-in for the king. So he looks assertive and powerful. He is telling Elfiva that she is the chosen one who is to be England's queen. And he touches her cheek in blessing. This is a visual echo of the biblical story of the Annunciation, when an angel appeared to the Virgin Mary and announced that she was the chosen one, that she would be the mother of the Redeemer, just as this virginal girl would be the mother of King Edward. Now let's go back to that border, just above and a little to the left of Alviva, where there are two very bashful looking sheep. Notice that their hoofs are touching like two strangers who are being wed. They represent the marriage that followed the betrothal that's pictured below. And so if you go from the picture below up to the marriage and then further to the left, there we have the king and queen, Ethelred and his bride. So we have betrothal, marriage, and enthronement are all captured in these images. But there are images in the lower border too that we have to consider. They are two of the eight naked figures who appear in the tapestry borders. Now the naked figures in the border are not always a commentary on the main section, but in this case, scholars seem to think that one of them must be because the figure just below Elfivu, standing with his hand outstretched, seems to mirror the image of the priest above. I think that he too is meant to reinforce the idea of a royal marriage, this time portraying what must come after the vows have been given. Elfiva will not only be wedded, but bedded. 
This figure of a naked man, like the priest above him, is a stand-in for the English king. This marriage was consummated. And we know that Edwards, there was questionable his, his, the consummation of his marriage. But the fruit of this marriage was King Edward, the confessor. Now we need to think about that little man to the left who appears to be chopping at a piece of wood. I suggest that this is a reference to a phrase that has come down to, the, to us today as a chip off the old block. That phrase was first noted by Theocritus in 270 BC. In England, it was already a proverb, was written down in the 1600s as part of a sermon, and it was mentioned as a chip of the old block. Now, it's possible that what we're seeing, that it was known in England, even in the 11th century. And what we're seeing here is that William is a chip of the ancient royal block, thus linking, linking him to Edward's bloodline. Why is this carpenter naked? You know, I think the embroiderers might be having a bit of fun here. They're known to be sometimes, um, there's some sly humor uh, in the tapestry. And I think maybe they're suggesting that royal or not, whether you're a duke or a king or an earl or a carpenter, we are all the same underneath our trappings. So these images of betrothal, of royal marriage, of enthronement, of consummation, and even the chip of the old block convey the idea of the blood link between William and Edward that is the focus of the conversation between Duke William and Earl Harold. Why then, if this tapestry was commissioned by a Norman, why is Emma referred to as Alviva and not by her Norman name? Because for 50 years as Queen of England, she bore the official name Alviva and that name linked her to a sanctified English dynasty. What is being emphasized here is not William's relationship to the daughter of a Norman Duke, to a girl named Emma, but William's blood link to the queen named Alfieva, who was the mother of Edward the Confessor and thus justifying William's claim to the English throne. I rest my case. Who's next? <laughs> All right, very good. That was interesting. Um, I'm interested to see what our listeners are going to think and how they're going to vote, but we have a couple more to go still, so don't decide yet. Next, we have Paula Lofting, and she's going to unmute herself and make her case for Elf Gifu of Northampton. All right. Okay, so um, my turn now. Um, I'm um, the lady I'm going to um, put forward as the um, candidate for the mysterious lady of the ba uh, Bayer Tapestry is a lady called Elf Gifu of Northampton. Um, England in the 11th century, as, as Sharon has already said, um, was filled with women called Elf Gifu. Um, Elf Gifu is the Anglo-Saxon uh, version of the name and Elf Giver, um, I do believe is probably the Latin version. Um, so they are the same name, just different spellings. Um, she was the daughter of Elfhelm, Helm, who was killed on the orders of Athelred, and her younger brothers Wolfgate and Wolfhere were all uh, blinded. Um, they were quite young, and, and they were they had their eyes removed, uh, or ever ha however they did it in those days. I'm not quite sure. Um, Swain Forkbeard, who was invading England at the time, he was a Dane a Danish, uh, the Danish king, and he organized that his son Canute would wed Alf Gifu, and they were probably hand fast, fasted um, to consolidate support from the powerful northern dynasties in the north of which she was from. Um, she might have even been kin to Alfgar of Mercia's wife, who was also called Alf Gifu. Um, Canute later married a pretend elf Gifu, who was really called Emma, but it might have been pertinent for Canute to carry on calling her elf Gifu, so that if he forgot which um, wife he was with at the time, it wouldn't really matter. Elf Gifu, number one, went on to give birth to two sons named Swain and Harold. There were rumours that these boys were not actually hers and that because she was barren, 
she had enlisted the help of a priest or a monk to pass over two children by, by a serving maid as hers. Now, whether these babies were fathered on the serving maid by the priest or that the priest and Elfgifu were lovers, and had given birth to these babies herself has never really been verified. There are different versions of the story. There is also a mention of a cobbler being one of the fathers, perhaps. It's well known that the two women in Canute's life disliked each other intensely. Naturally, they would. They would have seen each other as rivals, which is why Canute thought it was a good idea to, give them di to have them in different parts of the hemisphere when he was alive. Um, they went to head, head to head after Canute's death, actually, when the succession was in question as to which son was going to succeed the throne, whether it would be Elfgifu's um, son or Emma's son, Father Canute. Emma accused Elfgifu of passing off Harold and Spain as his sons when they really weren't. Of course, Elfgifu strongly denied the accusation and such a uh, an outrageous allegation was of no consequence to the outcome anyway, because the Witten went for Harold, Harold Harefoot, who was um, Elfgifu's son. And um, it seemed it was more expedient to have the son um, who was actually in the country at the time to take the throne. Um, Canute's other son by Emma was um, having problems in Denmark where his father, Canute, had sent him um, to administer and there was problems there, so he couldn't really return. And he didn't actually return for about another five years, I believe, um, after his half-brother's -bro death, and he took the throne then. So why do I think that the woman on the Bayer Tapestry was, the, was Elfgifu of Northampton? So if we, if Sharon could just point her little um, cursor to where to that yes this one <laughs> so this scene isn't actually happening in real time so she's not actually there she's not in the presence of um, the Duke and Harold and the men um, in in that scene she is that is a scene that has been created to kind of show the viewer that this is what they are talking about. They're having this conversation, which also involves this chap here. Yep, this little, little one here with the beard who looks like more like an Englishman and the one next to him. The other side, <laughs> this Harkon. <laughs> the one who's meant to be Harkon. Um, so let me just explain these three scenes. In the first one, we see Harold riding I don't know if you can point to this, yeah. Harold's riding back um, from having been taken um, captive in Pontia. Uh, he first journeyed to, um, basically, I might as well start from the beginning. Um, he was um, on his way to Normandy from England um, to secure the release of his um, kinsmen, Wolf, Wolfnoth and Harkon, who had been as Sharon also um, claims, spirited away uh, about 14 years ago as hostages. So this person here hanging on to the side of the church, Sharon, yeah, this one here, that is according to Andrew Bridges, or Andrew Bridgeford rather, who wrote um, a book about the Bayer Tapestry, that is supposed to be his um, Harold's brother, Wolfnoth. Now it doesn't have his name there, but that is what um, we believe he may have been or who he may have been. Now you can see he's kind of hanging on the side of, you know, a, a balcony or a step or th this is a church, which sort of says to me that perhaps he was in the service of the church at the time as he grew up in um, Normandy when he was taken hostage. That might have been where he ended up um, in the church. And I think that because at the end of his life, this young man, he actually was in the, as a monk, he died as a monk in the church. Um, so he seems to be 
sort of waving or pointing to Harold, saying, Harold, at last, you know, you've come to rescue me. And Harold seems to have his hand to his mouth and he's got his finger over his lips saying, shh, don't say anything, keep quiet. You know, don't, don't say anything yet. Um, so he may or may not have known that he was coming. Um, so inside the palace here, Harold and, um, is standing before William and he is pointing his, he may or may not be pointing at Elfgiver there, but I don't think he is. I think he's pointing at this chappy here, who we believe is Harkon because he looks more like an Englishman than the rest of the chaps. If you know anything about Anglo-Saxon um, and Norman sort of hairstyles, you might see that, I don't know if you can see this because it's very, very tiny, um, but you may know that the Normans tended to have a very monk-like hairstyle um, that was fairly long in the front and shaven up the back, whereas the English were known to have had longer hair and beards. Um, whereas the Normans were usually unshaven. So, um, so Harkon, he was the other um, kinsman of Harold who was taken as a hostage. And Harold is explaining to William that his purpose of the visit is actually to negotiate the release of his kinsmen and bring them back home. Um, I think that here, if we move along to Elfgifu, Elfgiver or Elfgifu, um, so she, if I think this is Elfgifu of Northampton, now she actually doesn't have anything to do with the story or anything to do with this particular scene, um, what's going on. However, Underneath here is very reminiscent of, I mean, there's obviously a scandal. And this chappy here, who is a, a workman of some sort, with the chip off the old block. And also, if you, I agree with the peacocks. Um, I think that was Pat that was talking about the peacocks. Uh, you know, that is there signifying that they are talking about a royal bloodline there. Don't know whose it is, but I'll tell you why I think. It is well, who I think it is in a minute. So we come back to Elf Gifu of Northampton, who shouldn't really be, be there, but is. And the reason I think that is because um, there is, it signifies a scandal here. You've got a naked man with a, his um, bits on show, if you like, pointing almost up her skirt, which is quite indicative of a scandal of some sort. Um, why is the monk there or the priest there and um, some people have claimed this to be Bishop Odo um, I totally don't agree with that because he was too important a person to be involved in a scandal maybe but um, I don't think it's a bishop because if it was a bishop it would say not say clericus at the top here it would say episcopus which is a bishop in Latin um, why he's there with Elfgifu of Northampton is that he could it could be depicting the chappy who um, helped Elf Gifu uh, sort out, source two babies for her to pass off as Harold's, um, sorry, Canute's sons. I know this is very convoluted, but that's the sort of thing I go for. I like something with lots of twists and turns and um, a bit of chaos, if you like. Um, so when I thought about this, I was absolutely, when I was reading about this as well, because this is, this is something that um, is talked about in Bridgeford's book. I mean, he doesn't actually say who he thinks this person is, but he does agree that this does seem to point to Elf Gifu of Northampton. Um, but because he can't come up with a plausible or and he can't come up with a concrete um, evidence that it is her, he denies that really so um he he doesn't sort of further expand on that i'm going to take a plunge here and um you're probably all going to think i'm totally mad and balmy and silly it's a silly idea perhaps it is a silly idea but as sharon said there are mistakes in the um Bayer tapestry names are mistaken i'm kind of wondering whether she they are actually talking about the bloodline because i've i've got this 
idea in my head that maybe when William talks to Harold about him being the heir to the throne because William, uh, sorry, King Edward has promised him the throne many years ago, as it was rumoured, Harold is then saying, well, we've already got an atheling and he is Edgar, who is the great, who is the grandson of Edmund Ironside, who, who's, um, who, this lady here, Edgifu, is not actually Elfgifu, but Edgifu. So someone, somehow, William has got the tale of Elfgifu of Northampton and her scandal mixed up with the wife of Edmund Ironside. And there is a mistake on that. So he's saying, well, no, William is saying, no, 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 no. Um, he can't, Edgar, I'm, um, Edgar, the Atheling, can't be the Atheling because he's not really, um, he's not really of the royal bloodline. He's actually the son of a cobbler or a priest. Now, I know that sounds really twisted and really convoluted, but that's my theory as to why she's on there. So I do think it's Elf Gifu of Northampton, but I think I think it's a mistake in there. I could I could go on talking about it for a bit longer, but I haven't got time. <laughs> and <laughs> um, and and that's my theory. So just to recap, um, it's like a, a bit like you know rumors can become like Chinese whispers. They start out um, with saying one thing and they end up another thing. And I I think that's what's happened in this case. He, um, William has got the wrong end of the stick and um, his argument that William, uh, that Edgar couldn't possibly be the atheling above him because he's not actually of royal blood. He's the son of a, a priest or a cobbler. Um, and that's my theory. So, and, and as mad as it sounds, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> All right, thank you, Paula. That was a, an interesting case that you made and I'm glad that you commented on how much you like chaos because I should have introduced Paula as the actual founder of our group of our historical writers forum. She is the one who has brought us all together into this group that now has uh, I think we're at around 900 members now on Facebook and uh, we have a Twitter account. We've uh, put out an anthology and it all come, you know, Paula says it's chaos. Sometimes it feels a little bit like chaos, but a lot of great stuff has come out of it. And we're also thankful to her for that. So um, great case for your lady. And we're going to move on to our last person then, Carol McGrath. And she's going to talk about Elf Giva, the sister of King Harold. Yeah. Hi. Um, in 2011, I attended a conference um, in the British Museum, a two-day conference about the Bayer Tapestry. And this is where I first came across this theory. I knew the theory that Paul was put across. I sort of was aware of Sharon's. I did not ever come across Pat's very good argument for that one as well. Um, and this one just blew my mind because I could see the point of it that I'm the one I'm going to speak about. And, and what I'm going to do is to explain it is to go back to the sources. Both, first of all, I'll mention a few um, secondary sources, uh, books that have been written over the last hundred years about the Bayou Tapestry, where this theory has been um, suggested. Um, first of all, we've got um, Frank Barlow in 2002, believed that it was Harold's sister. M. W. Camwell in 1984 also believed this figure was Harold's sister. E. A. Freeman in 1867 believed this was Harold's sister because he did have a sister called Algifu, or Algiva. Emma Mason in 2004 in her book puts across the theory that um, it could possibly be a sister of Harold's. And then the book that came out of the um, conference about the Bayou Tapestry in the British Museum, which I'm just going to hold up. I don't know if you can, or you probably can't see that, but perhaps you can. That book um, has a summary of all the lectures that happened. And the person who, wrote, who gave the lecture on 
um, our giver was Patricia Stevenson. And she based, as did the others, their arguments on Edmer of Canterbury, who was a primary source uh, at the end of the um, 11th century he was writing and he was based in Canterbury and I think although it's two decades on from the Battle of Hastings and maybe a little bit more when he was actually writing his chronicles um, it's pretty close to the events. Um, I think first of all um, you need to look at the scene to the left the one that we've been mentioning where Harold and William are in the palace and Harold is pointing, two figures are depicted in a hall, William seated, Harold pointing to the woman named as Algiva on the tapestry. And she is standing under two dragon headed pillars festooned with garlands. Now, if we could just see those pillars, if we could see that vignette a little bit more close up, is that possible for now? Um, if you just look, at the, um, at the pillars themselves, you can see that they look like they're festooned with garlics. Now, you wonder, garlands, you wonder if they could have been discussing a potential marriage. Audrey Vitalis, primary source, writing at the time, suggested, well, writing a little bit after the times, to be fair, that there were discussions then that Harold would marry a daughter of William and Algiva, Harold's sister, would marry a Norman magnate. So the problem was that Harold's sister was a nun. She was actually a nun of Wilton Abbey. Maybe at the time whenever Harold was in Normandy, she was either still a novice nun, because remember the tapestry was actually stitched um, a good 10 years or so after Harold's visits to, visit to Normandy. She, there was an Algiva, um, uh, uh, probably Harold's sister, who was um, actually the abbess of Wilton between 1066, 1067 to 1068. And of course, Harold is gesturing quite dramatically towards this figure. He's animated and he's drawing attention and, and drawing attention to her eyes as he points, at least that's the thought. Wilton is probably the location for this vignette because Wilton is very, very important as a religious institution and particularly associated with the Godwin family, the Godwin women uh, especially. Because in Wilton, there was a school for young noble women, probably attended by the poet Muriel. She was possibly from Normandy as well as the Godwin women at the time. Queen Edith retired to Wilton post conquest. She was responsible for the rebuilding of Wilton, Wilton Abbey, the Wilton Abbey Church at the same time as her husband was uh, responsible for the rebuilding of Westminster Abbey. And um, she also was responsible for the rebuilding of the entrance gates. And the suggestion is that those entrance gates, um, just to the, to the right as I'm looking at it, of the priest, yeah, They've got crosses on them, on the gates. Now those crosses, that description of that building is reported by Goslin, G-O-S-C-E-L-I-N, who actually was the abbess's cha uh, chaplain at the time, the abbess's chaplain at the time, but also very connected to Queen Edith, who would have been Algiva's sister. Now Queen Edith would have been Dowager Queen Edith um, after um, the death of Edward the Confessor, of course. Now Gosselin the cleric seems to be, we think it's possibly Gosselin himself who's in that picture um, touching her eyes within what could be a little chapel. So Jos Gosselin, um, she is standing perhaps in her own gateway because that's just a little chapel beside the main abbey church. And there's a story about that chapel, which I'll come to. She's the only woman name, which may be significant for all of those women who may have been working on the tapestry. If you accept that the tapestry was designed in Canterbury 
commissioned by Bishop Odell possibly, designed in Canterbury, um, and there's reasons why um, specialists to do with the tapestry do believe that it was designed in Canterbury. It's connected to the, the, um, the cartoons uh, that are, which would have been embroidered, the actual drawings, very, very similar to um, the Canterbury style that you would find in, in religious works coming out of that, that um, period um, in Canterbury. So if you accept it was stitched at Wilton and possibly Shaftesbury Abbey, then um, you can see that the um, nuns or, or the, the women who were stitching it um, were very close to the story. And of course, also importantly, Goslin, who was the chaplain to these women, to, to um, the two sisters, tells the story of a miraculous healing of Algiva, who became the abbess, Algiva's eyesight after an accident that caused her blindness when an oil lamp splashed, spilled, uh, one of those hanging oil lamps splashed, spilled and blinded her. Now, when she fell asleep, when she was sleeping, Goslin reports, and he wrote a book about St. Edith, um, who's connected with that chapel. That chapel was dedicated and belonged to St. Edith. And I'll come back to her in just a minute. Whilst Algiva slept, Goslin says that she had a vision of St. Edith making the sign of a cross, which we see above in the margin, over her. It's possible that Harold not only was telling her, um, was not only telling William that his um, sister was unavailable because she was a nun um, and had taken her vows perhaps moved from the Abbey School further on, decided to take vows. Um, Harold may also be telling William about this particular miracle, explaining that St Edith was the illegitimate daughter of King Edgar and Wolfrith, who was at the Abbey School and who King Edgar in the 900s, late 900s, abducted from Wilton. She returned to Wilton Abbey with her daughter Edith, who became a nun abbess as well. Built the small chapel, which I think this building is, in 984, and who, amazingly, was responsible for miracles after her death. Now, a contemporary audience would be very used to miracles. And they would understand that the vignette denoted the place where a cleric and Algiva were proclaiming a recent miracle. Also, you can tie that in with the um, renovations at Wilton, which were happening at that time. Goslin also was actually present at the dedication of that chapel, the dedication of the um, Abbey, new Abbey Church. And he also was present at the, uh, so he's very important, a very important um, cleric. And he was also present at the dedication of Westminster Abbey, the new Westminster Abbey that Edward the Confessor was responsible for a year after these events. And about 10 years um, before the tapestry was um, completed. Now, finally, let's have a thought about the naked men, those two naked men. There's one with an adze, which is a tool for ch chipping wood. We spoke about that earlier. I think Pat mentioned that one, pulled towards you, used it in a symbolic way uh, in Pat's um, argument. But I think it's probably more connected with the rebuilding of um, Wilton Abbey and just the whole um, circumstance and why Goslin is there and, and um, why Algiva is standing there. Um, it's possibly also the second naked man could be connected to marriage, um, or he could be connected to the story of St. Edith, who was, the, uh, who, who was born out of an illegitimate relationship and possibly a rape, we don't know. But I am convinced that the um, location for that vignette is actually Wilton because it was so important to the Godwin family and particularly the Godwin women. I think 
she is Harold's sister. And I do believe that the first half of the tapestry centers around events that were pertinent to the Godwins, particularly the Godwin women and obviously to Harold. And that um, the cleric who is standing inside the um, doorway, that's festooned, um, is actually Goslin himself. And it's also thought that Goslin was one of the um, clerics that perhaps um, Dowager Queen Edith used to help write um, the Vetus Edwardi, which actually was begun round about this time before the Battle of Hastings. So he was a very, very important family cleric, actually. And that's why I, I um, put forward the possibility that um, the priestess Goslin, the woman who is dressed um, co practically completely covered up, is, is probably um, Harold's sister Algiva, who became an abbess of Wilton and unfortunately died, um, but probably was alive at the time whenever the tapestry was started. And I think that the fact that Goslin has in his writings described the uh, new abbey church and, and the crosses on the um, doorway and the actual lozenge um, kind of uh, uh, patterning above, which is distinctly English and not Norman. For example, in Rouen, you've got a completely different kind of patterning um, in, in these buildings. Um, so I actually think that it is very likely that, that it's Wilton where the tapestry was perhaps um, stitched. And I do think that the figure is, is Harold's sister. So I rest my case. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you, Carol. Um, so the next thing we want to do is to let each of our panelists challenge one of the other panelists. So this should be fun. Um, so I guess since Sharon, since you presented first, do you want to make the first challenge also? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> I'm thinking of changing my mind the moment to try argument. <laughs> Somebody had a really good argument, I guess. I don't know, it was when I wrote the book in the first place, that chapter. <laughs> oh, funny. <sighs> oh. Who would I challenge? Um. um now, it was more clarification with Paula. So you're suggesting that the tapestry got confused in its elf kiffers as much as we did. In the, in the, <laughs> the scandal the wrong way around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, um, I was convinced. I mean, um, one of the things, uh, interesting enough, Lee, enough, I never actually thought about um, Harkon's mother at the time but I um the what I was saying about the man in the um you know the men in the um in the borders one of them was a workman um type thing and, and it was suggested that um there was a workman who could possibly have been one of the fathers of the children so that sort of kind of um made it you know me think that that could be her and and, and with my novelist head on, I was thinking about a storyline where uh, William mm -hmm. and Harold are talking about the succession, which they must have spoken about. And I feel that as Edgar Atheling was the Atheling, not William, Harold would have had to have said, well, I'm sorry, mate, but we've already got an Atheling. We don't need another one sort of thing. And, um, and of course, Ed, you know, Ed, he William maybe perhaps in his sort of could have could have got the whole story wrong and said no 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 you know in his very French accent and no 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 <laughs> this is this is not how it is <laughs> this is not how it is <laughs> and um was trying to say you know no he's that can't be right because his mother was um a, a trollop basically and you know he was born of, of a priest or a workman. And, and that, was, that was how I kind of thought that even if it wasn't that theory particularly, 
it was um you know one of those chinese whispers that had completely started out as something else and ended up as, as something else so mm. <laughs> you know um it does sound completely mad there is no evidence for it but um i kind of you know think that it could be plausible all right paula who would you like to challenge do you have a question? Um, I'd like to challenge Carol, actually. Because... Ooh, thank you. <laughs> I don't, the reason why I don't think it was Harold's sister, Elf Giver, Elf Gifu, or Elf Giver, because she didn't exist. And the reason why... Why do you why, think she didn't exist? Because, I'll tell you why. He didn't have a sister called Elf Gifu. He had a sister called Eve Gifu. She was offered up as a bride for a Norman friend of William's in that whole conversation. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. And according to Anne Williams, she was possibly dead in 1066 because um, it was documented in the Doomsday Book that a reeve was running her estate that had been she had been given by her father. Um, Edmo records that Harold offered to send the dead body of his sister to William when they when this toing and froing was going backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. Harold had taken William's throne, or not William's throne really, but he'd taken the throne, and um, William had said, "You know, uh, what about uh, give me your sister and send her over now, sort of thing." And he said, "I'll send you her dead body if you like." Apparently, and I've heard that important. story too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've heard that story. So, let me tell you why I don't think that Harold had a sister called Elf Giver, because um, in in the Doomsday Book in Buckinghamshire, there were several Elf Givers. Um, well, there were several Elf Givers in the whole of the book, but um, there was one particular, and I had to draw this. This is worse than my actual. Um, convoluted idea of the Chinese whisper. Um, Harold of Buckinghamshire, um, he, he had a wife called Elf Gifu. Now, Harold of Buckinghamshire has been mistaken for Earl, the Earl of Buckinghamshire. And he wasn't an Earl, he was a Thane. So Harold, um, this Harold of Bucks had a wife called Elf Gifu. And he also had a sister called Elf Gifu, and she was married to a man called Sibby. And he had a sons. Um, he was also married. No, wait a minute. He wasn't married. He was married to Eid Gifu. No, he wasn't. Someone else was. But Sibby had um, children called Ser uh, two boys called Sarik and Syrid, who had married this lady called Eid Gifu. Now, the scribe who recorded the entry in the Doomsday Book mistakenly named him as Earl Harold in the entry for Waldridge. In the entry for Turlingham, he was clear he was not the Earl, he was the Thane. Harold didn't, Harold Godwinson didn't have this land. This was not his land. So therefore, this Elf Gifu that everyone thought that might have, that somebody, people thought was, Harold's sister actually wasn't Harold's sister and she wasn't the daughter of Earl Godwin so um except that um you did say earlier that Harold did have a sister I mean the names are kind of pretty similar and we do know that the Godwin daughters were very closely associated with Wilton Abbey and um, we do know that Queen Edith herself was associated with, with Wilton Abbey. And then how do you account for... We, I mean, it is possible that Harold did say to William, well, you know, I'll send her your dead body. Uh, her, I mean, I don't know where, what source that comes from, but... Um, it comes from Edmar. From Edmar? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Edmar may have said that. Yes, that may be, may be, may be absolutely so that he may have said that. And yes, Edmar does um, promote the idea of the uh, marriage thing. Um, and a couple of them do that. A couple of the primary sources do that. But it still is a fact that there was um, an Algiva who was Abbess of Wilton in 1066, 1067. Yes, but El Godwin didn't have a daughter. So, so yeah, yeah, well, what are you saying her name was then? What are you There's saying? Another, there was another daughter called Edgufu. 
egg if And she was okay. definitely his daughter. But the other thing as well, I couldn't work out what the whole, what, what the purpose of her being on that, um, when you well, talked about all the background, really. <laughs> well, the marriage discussion was what was really, as you say yourself, what Ed, Edma was um, putting forward. And it was also mentioned by, um, oh, the other um, source, it was also mentioned by, um, Odoric Vitalis, he, he mentioned it as well, the possibility of the, the marriage discussions. Yeah. They, and they then think it must have, then they think it must have been interesting. You know, suggesting marriage is the, uh, the peacocks, as you say, so it's a royal discussion. Um, so there's that aspect of it as well. Um, we just don't have birth, uh, you know, birth and death dates for some of these women. So that yeah. does make it rather difficult. To yeah, I agree. Prove I agree. Or disprove, or to prove or disprove. Um, the whole thing about the Bayeux Tapestry is uh, not the Bayeux Tapestry, the Doomsday Book um, is beside the point, I think, because um, I don't see how that necessarily totally connects there. Um, I mean, because I, just, I, think, I think the point, the point that how, um, Anne Williams was making was that she, um, that that people have thought that he had a sister called Elf Gifu, uh, but there is no yes. record of her being his daughter. No, every, every, one, uh, every one of his children are named, yeah, yeah, um, except for Elf Giffa. And that, yeah, that was she was, uh, you know, putting forward the theory that that was where maybe the. Yeah, it's very interesting you should say that there. because Anne Williams was at that conference and her. After that lecture, that particular lecture, I seem to remember, and I think I'm right in saying this, that she did say, we have to look at Jocelyn's writings, Gosselin's writings, because we don't often, I mean, Gosselin's writings are not very often looked at. This whole story of the um, St. Edith and the whole story about the blinding, the fact that um, the abbess, or the Al Gifu, assuming it is Harold's sister, um, was um, you know blinded in an accident, and then there was this miracle and so on. That that's that's in the Goslin. That's Goslin reports mm. that, and it is a fact that Goslin was, and Anne Williams accepts that that Goslin was actually um, uh, the, the uh, cleric associated with Wilton Abbey and specifically associated with the um, the Godwin family, and that. He was present at the um, dedication of the new Abbey Church, and he was also present at the parallel dedication of the um, church in um, in Westminster, Edward the Confessor's Church. So, God, don't know that that so she accepts that. Anne Williams accepts that he was a very important cleric, but I mean, I I, I do accept that Anne Williams did. Um, she just simply said, "We need to look at Goslin more closely." Because he's not examined, you know, he wasn't, ex his writings weren't examined. Um, okay, I, I think that's fair, that's a fair point. I, I think we probably better move on to someone else. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah that, that's all time. I can say about that. And all I can say too is, is that, the, I mean, according to Goslin's um, descriptions of the um, Abbey Church, they tie up with what we're looking at up on, the, on that particular um, vignette on the tapestry. And plus, then you tie it with the fact that it's very likely, and Andrew Bridgeworth promotes this as well as does Carola Hicks. Yeah, he does. Yeah, that the um, that 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 the embroidery was done mostly in Wilton, and that Queen Edith had, you know, a lot to do with that as well. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Who do you want to question or challenge? Oh, who do I? Um, um, I'll challenge, um, I'll challenge Pat, I think. I'm just wondering, um, well, there is, I, I was going to say, why is there, you know, why did Edith, if, if we, no, sorry, if we accept that that is, um, Emma, Emma as Algiva, standing there, I mean, 
why is she dressed as she is and why does she not look a little bit more royal? <laughs> I think that's because of the, um, <laughs> I think that's because number one, she's not royal at that time. She's a young woman, but I think also, you know, no, um, that's part of woman. the, mm -hmm. that's part of what they're trying to do. As I mentioned, equating this with the Annunciation. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, um, the Hyde Abbey manuscript that shows uh, the Virgin Mary at the top and has Emma below and Knut, they're mm -hmm. giving that, that cross. Mm -hmm. This character is very similar to the character of the Virgin Mary in that particular mm. um, uh, manuscript. And so yeah, I think yeah, yeah. They're, they're trying to Make equate like this the Virgin Mary. virginal <laughs> girl with the Virgin mm -hmm. Mary. I think that's okay. why. Mm -hmm. I just wondered about that. Um, Yeah. Okay. I knew this was all me. I mean, <laughs> I did some other reading and didn't mm -hmm. like what I was reading um, about mm -hmm. others. And someone commented that, you know, the little man with the ads and the and the block of mm -hmm. wood. Well, that was someone making. Uh, uh, There's a gentleman named Freeman, not not E. A. Freeman, but another Freeman saying, "Well, he's making the the plowshares that Emma was going to have to walk across," and so. That's what that's mm. about. Um, I don't agree with that. I think this is an ads and we see it in another uh, part of the tapestry later on where a man is climbing a tree and he's got that same- Yeah, you see him doing that, that's absolutely so, to, yeah. To, to, to skim the, chip chip the bark off the tree. So I think that's what's happening. And that's why I, I came up with this idea of the chip off the chip of the old block that to me to work well. <laughs> <laughs> well it's, it's a very interesting theory and and it's uh, i mean all all of the theories are very interesting um and it is a very mysterious um vignette but i must say another thing about the um bayou tapestry is that pointing is very important in the tapestry because it, yeah. pointing shows movement through the events of the tapestry and sometimes when you get a wide scene, a, a large scene, like, for example, the death of um, King Edward, um, the viewer will be looking from one, one side of the scene to the other side of the scene to the centre. So the centre and then going out to the, um, the scenes on either side. It's, it's, um, it's quite interesting, almost like a sort of 3D effect, really. If you see what I mean, that, you know, you're looking and you're looking, it's all part of the, the whole thing. And then you get, a, I, I don't think there's a point in that particular scene, but so often you have pointing, moving people forward so that, you know, because they're seeing a central scene and a scene on either side, and then they're moving on to something else. So you will have pointing to move people forward um, as they're viewing the tapestry. I mean, contemporary people. Right. Okay. Okay. Sometimes they're pointing to the names. They're pointing to what's happening up above. Or they're pointing so to the names. That's connect. absolutely so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they're directing yeah. us. They're directing us, the viewer. Mm -hmm. um, well, if I, if, I, if I were to pose a, a, an objection, a question, it, it goes to all of my other marvelous colleagues. And that is, <laughs> I don't see how any of these other explanations actually have to do with the basic story of the tapestry, which is how did this, it begins in England and it takes all the way through it, all of it is pointing towards that battle at the end. And I don't see how these other things really connect significantly to that. Um, and that's why I think that Elfiva as Emma is important because it's that basic link to between William and Edward, and that he's trying to convince uh, Harold to join to, to join him. And of course, interestingly, the man who actually succeeded Edward was the only man who didn't have a blood link to Edward the Confessor. That's very true. Or to but, Harkin, um, or but I think I think. <laughs> Sorry, I think there's another point to be made here. And I think that the first half of the tapestry is very much about the Godwin um, family. And the second half is very much about then leading from the death of Edward right through to the, um, 
right through to the Battle of Hastings and uh, presumably William's coronation, the missing piece. I, I don't, I don't really, I don't really see that. It's, and, it's and, just, and, I mean, uh, it just I, shows I was, the whole progression of Harold's abs- journey. Center Can I ask Pat, um, um, actually? No, I just need to finish. Oh, oh. sorry. Exactly central in that tapestry is the death of King Edward. The point Later. being that, you know, leading events leading up to his death in the year before, Harold going to Normandy, presumably to get his uh, nephew and um, brother back, who'd been hostages for uh, 10 years or so in Normandy. Um, I think that um, that is really very much about that journey and the consequences of that journey. But and Carol, the- we don't know that's why he went. We don't, we don't know that's why he went. There's one, know, there's one scholar what, who posits that he goes, that Harold is actually yeah, well, on his way to Europe to bring, you know, one Well, there are, I've read all those theories as well, but, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's that's a possible theory yeah, if you follow uh, that Can I just theory. say, he, he couldn't have been on his way to Europe to bring Edward Yeah, that happened earlier. Back, because, no, earlier. That, yeah, that happened in, ten, Edward was dead by this point. It was, you know, so... That wasn't what he was doing. Um, I think going to collect the hostages is incredibly plausible because he's got a brother and a nephew over there. So why wouldn't he? It's more likely to do that than to go over and give William a promise of a throne that he's going to later claim for himself. Sorry. Well, we don't know. <laughs> oh, somebody's just Pat, asked can I just stop? Can I just referring, ask sorry, somebody just asked who I was referring to talking about Goslin. Goslin yeah, we're, I think we're going to do Q&A after. Yeah, like, I am. But just to make that point, Goslin was actually a cleric associated with Wilton Abbey who wrote at the time and who was actually very closely associated with Dowager Queen Edith. And described the bold lightning earlier this week. <laughs> really? <laughs> he, was the news. He, was, he was in the news really? because they translated a bit that he's described oh. bold lightning. And it's the first description of ball lightning. So you know about Goslin. So Sharon, you know about Goslin. You know about Goslin. You know who he was. Yeah, I know about Goslin as well, but I don't know that much about him. But yeah, I wanted to um, say to you, you you were saying, I don't know what all these other things have got to do with the story. um, Because uh, Pat, yeah, Yeah. um, because the whole premise of the Williams, you, you know, of the Bayer Tapestry, as far as you're concerned, is that um, it, William is trying to convince Harold. And I don't think that at all. I think there is very much um, an English em- element. I think there's a Norman element. So you, it was made mm-hmm. in such a way that if you looked at it and you were a Absolutely. Norman, you'd say, oh yeah, this is where the yeah, Normans yes. came and you know, beat up the English and won the invasion and all that. And if you were an English person, you could say, yeah, see, look, he, he asked to go over there and pick them boys up from the, do you know what I'm saying? So either way, you would have looked at it. Now, I can't understand why you think that's Emma, because why would they portray Emma with a ma- naked man underneath her, pointing up at her up her skirt, <laughs> if, if, if that was really Emma, and in, in a scandalous way? Because well, I don't why, think why would they do his, that? Because I don't why couldn't they have just had a picture, you know, a picture? A, a, picture a nice picture of her sitting on a thing with a crown on her head <laughs> so I can't can't understand well number one the little naked man under there is not pointing he has his hand out touching as if he's he's actually he's mimicking. indicating mm-hmm. no it's not even a point he's mimicking the man that the priest oh yeah that's right you're saying this, that. He's he's in that argument he's, yeah he's, he's, but he's, he's also mimicking naked. the priest which indicates some sort of you know, well, scandal. you know what? If you're going to if you're going to um, have coitus in a marriage, somebody's got to be naked. Well, maybe they were never naked in Anglo-Saxon England, but I doubt it. Because but I don't, but you don't riddles. get pictures of <laughs> naked men everywhere in the other. <laughs> but you've got you, do, you do naked in the churches. Here, I mean, the churches were just a I said, let's have these guys be naked. Why not? So, I don't know. <laughs> Well, the churches did have an explanation. 
yeah. looking at the time guys and we need the questions from the audience yeah. right. <laughs> we could chat forever and yeah. argue for our <laughs> <way. Yes. laughs> we have actually had a couple of questions the <laughs> by our audience um one of them i think it was while carol was talking was asked if elf Eva could represent all of the female relatives of William and Harold rather than that specific. That is actually one argument I did put in my book in the chapter about Elfgiver was that because it was such a popular name, it may That's have just have represented some women, you know, the women of the families, in that it was just rep representing the noble ladies rather than one particular lady. But at the same time, it's a specific story that everybody knew in the 11th century, so much so that they didn't have to identify it any more than Elphiba. So, but I like the idea of the pillars that are festooned, those pillars yeah. within the chapel that she's standing being festooned and the idea that, that they could have been potentially talking about... Um, a marriage as is put forward as Paula says as well put forward by Edma and by I always forget his name Odoric Vitalis I don't think I like Odoric Vitalis very much <laughs> though Odoric was his name. name in the 1100s <laughs> I like Odoric. he likes the woman he like Odoric. I like Odoric <laughs> well he was very fair about the north wasn't he I have to admit he was very fair about that and you know Saxon was Saxon mother Norman father or the other way around Saxon I think it was mother I think mother. I think it was Saxon mother and Norman father, yeah. So he was sort of a little bit of both. Um, yeah. So I just meant I was being facetious there, saying I didn't like him. He's he's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know him really. Let's face it. So any, uh, any there, questions there, from the audience? Oh, sorry. I've seen a lot flashed up. There's some interesting questions yeah, well, there. Well, that's what I'm then. <laughs> yeah. There, there, there was a question for Pat asking if. If you believe this is Emma of Normandy, why didn't you refer to her by that name, Elfgiva? Mm, I saw that. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, because there were so many Elfgivas. And my other major character in my novels is Algiva of Northampton, who is an Elfgiva. Emma's mm. daughter by uh, Ethelred was Elfgiva. Ethelred's first wife was Elfgiva. <laughs> um, and what happened in the... 12th century, when the Normans took over, is that the name Emma became very popular. And we know Emma today as Emma, partly because of the encomium Emma Regina, because that is one place where she is referred to as Emma. All the other places um, later on, all the charters, when she signs Elkiva, they've gone in and added Emma as a gloss to her name, Elkiva. This is Simon Keynes com um, commenting on this. Okay. So they moved forward as as the time moved forward, she became more widely known as Emma. And so I decided to keep the name Emma. Um, and it's possible that she was known as Emma among her family, but as the official name of Elfiva, that was that was her official name. As well. I, I wonder if that was all it was used for, whether you know they called her Emma in private, sort of thing, maybe just used that as a ceremonial name. Mm, possibly. That's a very good point. Possibly. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it's in Latin, and Elgiba in Latin is how she how she is presented, which is the same name that's on the tapestry. Right. Um, let's see. We have another question. Could it be a repudiation of marriage with the man pointing his hand or fist at her? See what's written up without glasses. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to question which marriage would it be repudiating? Because there wasn't. Yeah. Um, unless you look at Harold with Edith Swanneck um, or Canute with his first elf giver. There's nobody in the 1066 story who repudiated a marriage at that time, sort of thing. It would have to it have be kind of to fit. earlier. It, it doesn't actually fit. Well, there's only the suggestion that Harold's sister was indeed called Algiva or, you know, the name, ceremonial name, whatever, that that other sister who was in um, Wilton Abbey, um, there's just the possibility that there was a suggestion. And I mean, it is mentioned 
by both Odoric Vitalis and by um, Edmar of Canterbury that there was the suggestion of these marriages. But why would, how do they fit in with that particular scene? That's the because thing. Because that's I think, what, possibly you know. what they're discussing. That, you know, um, I'm going to, you know, Harold knew that he was in a dicey situation once he was in, you know, with William. I mean, you've even, one of you said that, um, yeah, I think it was you, Paula, that was very interesting, that one of the hostages was, you know, in the balcony just before you get that long scene in the palace. Um, and that Harold was maybe going, Shh, don't don't say anything, you know, all would be fine. He knew that he was in a dicey situation and maybe all sorts of things, because William desperately wanted that throne. They knew that Edward was going to die at some point um, pretty soon. And um, I think he died sooner uh, than that. Not at that point, though, actually. He was quite healthy at that point. He was yes, he was. He died sooner yeah. when they knew that, you know, that there would be a death with a, a king who did not have a... A prince to follow him or, or you know a, a, an heir and and I do think that uh, the Godwins being the most important family in England at the time and the wealthiest possibly even wealthier than the king that you know how William was trying to make further links he had been promised the throne it is said in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and various other places by Edward some years before well, it doesn't actually say it was promised, though. Probably. Well, he... he no, it just says he came yeah. over in 1050. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. That, they, they think that might have been the later edition. But the thing is, as well, you've got to remember, if that, if he was a... Um, if he had offered the kingship to William, mm -hmm. it would have been repudiated at some... Or hopefully well, yeah, they were hoping they that Edward. it had gone away. Because Edgar Atheling kingship. is the only one that has got yeah. the title of Atheling. Yeah, so, yeah, true. That's that's absolutely true. But it's the timing. It's the, the timing of these things because there was the period whenever the Godwins were in exile. And and the Normans were had a very large presence at, at Edward the Confessor's court. Even Edith is his there isn't wife, much, you know, Godwin. Not, that most of the chronicles but don't actually of, mention it, only just well, one. There were there were a lot um, of Normans there. There were there were um quite a number of Norman priests. There was the Bishop of London, who I think was called Robert, who was a Norman. Yeah, Robert of so They weren't Robert terribly Norman, popular. Yeah. They weren't terribly yeah. popular, but they were no. on the borders on the, the borders, the marches of Wales, there was some Norman presence there. Early Norman castles. I mean, I, I agree because a, a load mm -hmm. of Normans ended up with Macbeth, didn't they? Because um, when yeah. um, the God, when the Goldwins came back, they all ran away up there. <laughs> but um, <All> right. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, is that they, that yeah. William no, I agree. I, I don't think William pulled it out of the air. I think mm -hmm. William had some grounds. I, I don't think he just imagined it. I think something no, no, was said, no, but I, no. it could I be. I think he could have misunderstood it though, because this yeah. was supposed to happen in 1052. And in 1056, they sent Harold to fetch Edward the Exile back. Yeah, so yeah that's what I was going to say. He, yeah. Maybe yeah, that's the Edward next thing. thought mm -hmm. that maybe Edward the Confessor didn't know that his nephew and... was alive. But at the same time, once he did, he if he had promised it to William, he must have turned around to William and said, look, you can't have it because Edward's. I've got my nephew back, yeah. and it's his. <laughs> uh, but also, Ed, Ed, Edward might have said to him, oh, I'll, I'll, you know, OK, William, I'll consider it when the time comes or mm. something. You know, and that's yeah, what I always imagine, that well, maybe they go about it. When I was suggesting Harold's sister, all I could go with was the um, the suggestions in the about marriage, these marriage um, discussions in those two chronicles. And then that was taken up by, as you know yourselves, by certain, um, you know, writers uh, secondary of secondary sources like Frank Barlow, and um, and others, Emma Mason, Freeman, M. W. Campbell, Campbell, and you know, then the, you know, this is just various theories, but that that actually does have some grounds. Um, the marriage suggestion does have some grounds in in actually primary sources. Yeah, I mean, there was there was a few mm. suggestions made after, I think it was the um, Harold mm. took the um, throne that he had promised to either marry someone or or 
you know, and that or get his sister to marry someone or one of his yeah, daughters even. That may so even was definitely. But I, yeah, I think that's probably... even the point at which this thing was said, um, I'll send you her body, you know. Yeah. It could have been after Hal took up the throne. Right. Right. Is there anybody that wants to actually ask? And let Samantha talk. <laughs> yeah. Should we let our audience vote? We're... Okay. All right. So they know that they've got to vote. I, can't I think uh, Sharon, we're going to let them raise their hand, right? So I'll uh, we'll just say anyone who wants to vote for well, our first presenter was Sharon with Edgifu, the Abbess of Leominster. So you can raise your hand if you want to vote. Does everyone know how to raise their hand on Zoom? There should be a little button, or you can, if we can see you, you can just raise your hand. But Same so if you, you, you have some, some supporters there, Sharon, they're, they're I have a couple. <laughs> <laughs> Come on guys. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. And then, um, no, I'm, I may have you guys out of order now. I have uh, Pat next. Were you second, Pat? Yes. Can I just I say, um, if, in order to raise your hand, if you look at the bottom of your screen, move your mouse towards the bottom of the screen, there's a button saying reactions. Click on that and it just says raise oh, hand. I see it. Yeah. You're right. You're right. I should have. Uh... Yeah. So can we do my vote again, just in case anyone we didn't can. vote? Yes, we can. We can. Let's go back to, back to Sharon. Oh, yeah. Everyone's figuring out. Can we out. vote as well? Right over. <laughs> can we vote right for over. ourselves? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm doing I didn't, did I? I am doing now. <laughs> it's beside apps, right. Maureen. It's beside yeah, apps. It's between so apps and record at the bottom of your screen. Right, so I've got five. <laughs> more. All right. So and then so next, if 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 you guys all put your or unclick your raised hands, and Pat made her case for Emma of Normandy. So if you would like to raise your hand to support that one, Emma, to support Emma, oh, there's Emma quite a few is, for Emma. Kathy yes. Tractor. Six. Six. <laughs> Kathy. The traitor. I thought you were my friend. <laughs> All right. Kathy was my friend. I'm not happy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't All think right. I'm going to get any. I'm, I'm not happy either. Raise hands. <laughs> Next, Paula with her chaos theory of LQ of Northampton, who would like to vote for Paula and her theory. Looks like Bandit Queen has voted twice. <laughs> <laughs> the poll's still only got two votes. <laughs> two votes. All right then. You've got to vote for yourself, Paula. Yeah, you yeah. <laughs> It wouldn't make much difference. <laughs> All right. And then Carol. Christine Brown, you better have voted for me. Oh, and Alison voted for Paula, but can't find a raise hand. One. So Paula's mm. got four votes. <laughs> I've got four. Okay. okay. <laughs> so the last one is Carol with Elfgiva, sister of King Harold. I thought so she was going to be everybody else. No, oh, Christine's someone. voted for me. My friend Christine's voted for me as well. So I've got five. Yeah, I voted. And can for we just Paula. say we need another option of none of the above? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've got any votes. <laughs> for old Harold's yeah. sister. One for Carol. Oh dear. <laughs> One. Are, are you oh, voting for yourself, goodness. Carol? Yeah, you could vote for yourself as well, Carol. <laughs> I better vote for myself. I'll give, I'll give myself two votes. <laughs> I, I think we put a lot of people to sleep. Well, we, we definitely must have some none of the above. <laughs> then how about I really don't know? And that's the thing. Okay, then everybody who doesn't know, raise your hand. <laughs> Not sure. Confused. He doesn't know. <laughs> We, we have at least one who doesn't know. Yeah, we but, haven't we yeah. haven't convinced everyone. <laughs> yeah, well, I I thought this was great, and I I'm 
happy that you guys asked me to be your host because I have learned a lot listening to you and you all made fantastic arguments for your ladies and I guess we'll probably never know but it's been a lot of fun to talk about who the possibilities are and just to spend time with you all I hope everyone who has come has enjoyed it as well and um, keep an eye out if you're not a member of Historical Writers Forum, but enjoy these talks. We plan to do more and all of the ones so far have been a lot of fun. So thanks for joining us all and have a great evening. Thank, Thank you everyone. very much everyone. Thank thanks a lot, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, well,